Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Ledette. I'm an associate professor of disease ecology and epidemiology. If we can learn more about the tick, that will help everyone prevent themselves from suffering from a tick-borne disease. Transmission of the bacteria or the tick-borne disease or the pathogen that causes the disease to humans is really interesting. And again, it differs by disease system. So if we think about Lyme disease again, which, which is the most common tick-borne disease in North America, it's a really unique system. The, the, the infected tick, either the nymph or the adult, because larvae um, are, are not infected with Lyme disease, once they attach to a human or any other host, this is a very common, this is similar between hosts, so any warm-blooded organism, that infected tick, it's important to know where the bacteria are. In the infected tick, the bacteria reside in the belly, the gut. We call it the mid-gut. It doesn't look like our gut. It's got a bunch of squiggly lines. But the bacteria reside in there. And when that tick is in the environment, exposed to environmental conditions, those bacteria are inactive. They're just sitting there hanging out, not doing anything, not wasting any energy because they have limited energy. The tick can only take a few blood meals in its life. So that bacteria is limited by what's around it. And right now you're in a tick that's hungry. So there's not a lot of sugar and candy going around for that bacteria to eat. So that bacteria is very, very um, um, non-motile, we like to call that. Now, once that tick attaches to a host, the first thing the tick does is it bites the host. It will find a, finds a place to bite. And a lot of times the ticks go to areas that, you, that they can't be found. And that's an evolutionary strategy because that tick wants to have a blood meal. It's gotta to go to an area where the host will not recognize it. And it's gotta stay there for a few days. Unlike a mosquito that can just go up, bite and leave, ticks have to hang out. Um, so they develop some evolutionary features or mechanisms to make that possible. One is going to a place where you're less likely to notice them armpit, groin, hair, those areas. All the areas that we're always afraid to, where we find ticks and we do our tick checks. Once the tick gets there, it starts inserting its mouth parts, known as the hypostome, into the skin. It uses a special organ that's like scissors that actually cut the skin, and then it inserts that little needle. Now, importantly about that needle, unlike a mosquito, that needle on a mosquito is like a syringe. Goes in and comes out, sharp as possible, because you don't want to feel that mosquito bite, even though you can. The tick has a needle that has barbs or teeth, almost like a fish hook, that point backwards. So once that needle's inserted, it can stay in there. Remember, the tick has to stay for multiple days, if not a week. So it wants to be well attached. So the tick is cutting the skin, inserting its mouth parts into the host, excreting chemicals to break down tissues, excreting chemicals like uh, uh, anesthetics where it keeps the host from feeling the bite because the, the host doesn't want to recognize the tick is biting it. The tick needs to spend multiple days on the host. Once the mouth parts are in the host, the tick will release a cement protein. It's, it's a, basically a chemical that helps attach. It's like a glue, helps keep that, that tick attached so it won't get brushed off if you brush it off accidentally. And then other chemicals that help break down the tissue and form a pool of blood in the host. The tick is basically taking a drink from a nice pool of blood. Unlike a mosquito that's looking for ve vessels um, to take, take the, the meal from. Now during this time, the tick is preparing for this huge meal. Again, remember the whole idea is the tick is supposed to stay undercover until it drops off. That's a week, it's gotta stay disguised. So if this tick starts feeding and gets nice and plump early on, it's more likely the host will recognize it. So that doesn't happen. The tick prepares for that really large blood meal. So think about this, think about the host or the human as a two liter jug of soda, a new two liter jug of soda. Let's shake up that human or that jug of soda. Do you wanna open that top right away? No, because if you do, you're gonna have soda all over, you're gonna have a huge mess to clean up. Similar for the tick. The tick doesn't, like a mosquito, take a blood meal really quickly. It opens up that top very slowly. And that is to get ready for this large amount of blood that's gonna come into its body so it doesn't explode and pop like a two liter bottle. That takes time. There's a lot of science going on there. We don't have time to get into that, but it takes time. But that, what that tick is doing is it's slowly taking in water. It's slowly creating that pool of blood over the first couple days. And then at the last couple days of feeding, usually the last three to four days, ticks take what was known as the big sip. That sounds kind of disgusting, but that's what it is. Ticks will from um, the last few, two to three days, depending on the life stage, will increase hugely and then drop off. 
because they don't wanna stay attached to you when they're the size of a grape. That's gotta happen very quickly so you don't notice them. They'll drop off and they'll then molt, lay eggs, do their thing in the environment. But how does that relate to disease transmission? Well, during that time period, during that slow phase, that slowly opening of that cap, those bacteria in the tick's gut are starting to feel different because the tick is taking in water, they're starting to take in a little bit of blood. Well, that blood is really warm. That blood has a different chemical composition than an unfed tick gut. The bacteria sense this and start replicating and increasing in numbers. Now, initially that's confined to the stomach of the tick, but eventually some of those spirochetes, some of those bacteria get out of the stomach and into the circulatory system, kind of like our veins and arteries. Now to be transmitted, the highway is to the salivary glands because the saliv salivary glands are the next step to that syringe into the host, the, the mouth parts. So the spirochetes that get to the salivary glands are primed to enter the host and that process from the midgut to the arteries or veins, the hemolymph, to the salivary glands takes around 24 hours. Now, um, that's not set in stone. It can be a little longer, it can be a little shorter, and it depends on the disease. Some diseases are much quicker than that. But for Ly Lyme disease, I like to use the cutoff point at 24 hours. At that point, we really start seeing the bacteria in the salivary glands and being slowly injected into the, into the host, the host that the, that the tick is feeding on. Now remember, the tick is gonna feed for five days, eight days on that host. So the longer that tick is attached after 24 hours where the spirochetes or the bacteria start getting into the host, the increased likelihood you have that more and more of those bacteria are getting injected. Because once that 24 hour time point hits, that tick is continuing to feed, continuing to inject the bacteria, increasing your likelihood that your body first can't fight off the initial bacteria that are invading, and then the likelihood you're gonna develop the disease. So that's why doing tick checks, preventing, taking ticks off as soon as possible prior to you know five days when they're as fat as a grape and you likely have had a transmission event is key to reducing your risk of getting a disease after a tick bite.